Well, good morning, Harvest. It is so good to be with you again this morning, to sing songs to our Savior, to open his word and allow his spirit to teach us. Praise God for opportunities like this. Praise God for his church, that we can come together and glorify his name. He is worthy. This morning, um, we are continuing in our series, Elijah, uh, the journey of fear and faith. And so we're in 1 Kings 17, verses 8 to 24. So go ahead and flip over in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, grab one and get over to 1 Kings 17, 8 to 24. That's our text for today. Um, when you get there, would you please stand with me for the reading of God's Word? We have a good chunk of Scripture to get through today, but we want to honor the Lord by standing as we read it out loud. 1 Kings 17, 8 says this. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said. And she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. And after this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? For you have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and, and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed. And he carried and he cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourned by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, thank you, Lord, for your word. Lord, thank you, though, Lord, that over thousands of years you have, preferred, uh, you, have per, you have kept it, O Lord, perfect for us through your spirit. Lord, thank you that we can gather here today as your church and, and see your word, O God, that your spirit carried along for so many years and now your spirit will teach it to us. Lord, O God, would our hearts be open to hear from you. O Lord, would you meet with us now. O God, we, we need you. Lord, if you're not here, we have nothing. And so, God, we need your presence. Lord, we need a word from you. We do not need the words from man. We need the word to come from you. Oh, so, God, would you please work in this place. Oh, Lord, we love you, and we thank you for all your grace and your love towards us. We pray this in the mighty name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So last week, we saw from the life of Elijah how to unlock the power of faith. We saw in the brook Kareth in the hidden life that he, as he went where God went, as he was certain in uncertainty that he was unable to unlock the power of faith in his life. And we too can unlock that power in our lives. And so if last week was the preparation of faith, this week is the practice of faith. We cannot just be hearers of the word, we have to be doers of the word as well. Here's a principle to live by. 
and a principle that is so true for all of us, it's this, that inward growth always leads to outward action. Inward growth always, 100% of the time, if you are saved in Jesus Christ, inward growth from the Spirit will lead to outward action. Let us never be a church that only knows the Word of God and, and never acts on God's Word. Let us right now be convicted. Oh God, convict us. If we've been going to church year after year, week after week, and we've heard it, but we've never practiced it. If we know what the faith is, but we've never sought it. Oh Lord, would you teach us through your spirit. Lord, help us never be only hearers, but always doers as well of your word. See, Elijah was not just a hearer of the word of God. He went to the brook Kareth for the time that he needed to unlock the power of faith in his life, and then he heard what he needed to hear, and then God called him to Zarephath. God called him to act on this faith. He did not leave this work for someone else. He did not leave it for someone else to complete. He did not sit idly by. He did not allow his life to be wasted. He went out and lived the power of faith, and so can we. So we can see from the text here, there's so many ways this text can be preached. There's, we could literally go three, four messages in the text today, but we got one. And I can see, I hope you can as well, four ways that Elijah lived in the power of faith. And four things we can take from him. The first one is this. To live in the power of faith, I will be courageous in obedience. To live in the power of faith, I will be courageous in obedience. You will be seeking to follow the Lord and do as he has commanded you. Just look at the text. It says, The word of the Lord came to him. Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. He arose and went to Zarephath. Just look at the obedience of Elijah in this. It's quite remarkable. It's quite amazing. God calls him to go to Zarephath. Why there? Right? Why there? I was looking at a map and I was like, this seems really strange. We have the map up on the screen here. It seems really strange that God would call him to go to Zarephath. Right? We know in our text last week that he was at the brook Hereth. So halfway up the screen on the right-hand side there, we see the brook Hereth. And we know in the story that he's going to end up going back to Ahab, who's probably in Samaria, which is quite low there, halfway on the map, or Jezreel, he's in that area, and he's going to end up in Mount Carmel. So why would God call him to Zarephath, which is so north on the map? It seems so out of the way. Not only that, we know that this is part, not part of Israel at all, this is part of Sidon. This is enemy territory. God calls him to go to Zarephath. I was thinking, this is so, so strange. So I read the books, I looked at the commentaries, I was trying to look at a lot smarter guys than me, see if they had any reason why God would call him to Zarephath. No one really mentions it, it's not really a thing, but it bothered me, so I continued to think about it, and I I came up with this. I think God called him to Zarephath because it was out of the way. I think God called him to Zarephath because Zarephath is a nothing. God called him to Zarephath because it is an enemy territory. He called him to Zarephath because there a widow, someone who has nothing, would feed him. It's almost like God's like, hey, I'm going to put a big challenge in front of myself, Elijah, but I'm going to provide anyway. I'm going to make you walk way out of the way. It's way out of the path of where you're going, but it may be inconvenient, but bring it on. Show me your faith. Show me your faith. You see, our obedience here has to be courageous, even when we don't understand why God is calling us to a certain place. Not humanly know how this is possible, but courageously know that God will get it done. Elijah believed this. Do you believe this? See, Zarephath literally means smelting furnace. That's what it means. That's what it means, smelting furnace. After being taught by the Lord what he needed to know at the brook Hereth, it was time to put his faith to the test in the furnace. Often God calls us to walk in this way. He teaches us, and then he puts us in the furnace. He puts us in Zarephath. Elijah, in his courageous obedience, had to have lots of contentment. He had to have contentment of the provision that God was calling him to. Obedience might not always look like our ideal living situation. Isn't that right? 
It's not always what we think we deserve or what even we could have. It's being content with what God has given you and how God has provided for you. In Elijah's case, he was probably, after three years alone in the wilderness, he was probably just happy to have someone to talk to, right? But he was in Zarephath, and he needed to be content. Is obedience in your life restricted because of a lack of contentment for what God has provided for you? Is obedience to God in your life being restricted because a lack of contentment for the way that God has provided? I love this verse, 1 Timothy 6.6. 6. It's kind of a life verse for me. It just always comes back. It always comes back. It says this, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. On the surface, it doesn't really seem to make much sense. Why? Because contentment is not moving forward. Contentment is being happy with what you have. Contentment is saying, this is enough. I don't need more. But what, but what uh, Paul says in, in 1 Timothy 6.6 6 is that godliness, godliness mixed with contentment is actually great gain. We're gaining from being content. Elijah knew this. That if we're godly and we're content with what the Lord has, we are having great gain because we have more of him. See, Elijah had to ask a widow for food. That's tough. That is tough. Could you imagine asking someone who has nothing to feed you? Just go downtown Toronto and you see a homeless man or homeless woman on the side of the road and you're like, hey, hey, how you doing? Can I get a few bucks? for a coffee? No one wants to do that. No one wants to do that. Could you imagine going to a hospital and seeing someone on their deathbed and being like, hey, could you help me move next Saturday? It's crazy, right? It's crazy. And yet God is calling Elijah to go to a widow and ask for food. Elijah knew, Elijah knew that his God would provide. Elijah knew that even though it didn't make sense, God was at work. Do you believe this? Do you believe this, that even when it doesn't make sense, that God is at work? See, obedience comes out of faith, right? Not the other way around. You have faith, and then out of your faith comes obedience. It can't be the other way around. You can't be like, I'm going to be really obedient to God and not have the faith because then it'll just become self-righteousness. It'll just become your works, right? It's not God's work. But when you have faith welling up within you, it will lead you to obedience. And as we are obedient to Christ, we will be blessed, even when it doesn't make sense. It will lead to blessing. God is calling us out of our comfort zone. God is calling us to do things that only can make sense in him. I love the way F.B. Meyer says this. No relation to me whatsoever. Um, he just happens to have the same last name. Um, British preacher in England in the 1800s. He said this, Our Savior adjures us to keep his commandments. And he does so because he wants us to taste his rarest gifts. And because he knows that in the keeping of his commandments, there is great reward. You see, as we step out in faith, as we, as we believe that, um, what God has called us to do, and we do that calling, even though it doesn't make sense to us, Jesus is calling us to these things because he wants us to taste his rarest gifts. He wants, to see his, us, he wants us to see him at work in a mighty way. He knows that if we keep his commandments, there is great reward. Your obedience will be courageous if you are living in the power of faith. Do you have this obedience in your life? The second thing we see from Elijah is that if we're going to live in the power of faith, we will be emptied of fear. We will be emptied of fear. If you're going to live in the power of faith, you will be emptied of fear every single time. Just look at the text. Verse 13, it says, And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day of the Lord sends rain upon the earth. The woman here, the woman here was filled with fear. 
and Elijah wasn't. Why? What's the difference? The woman was filled with fear, and Elijah wasn't. Why is this? Why is this? See, she needed proof, but Elijah knew. The only thing that will allow you to be empty to fear, the only thing that allowed Elijah to be empty to fear is the Word of God. It is the Word of God. The truth of who God is and what He promises should, and it will cause us to be emptied of fear. This is one of the major themes in all of Scripture, that we are fearful and God is faithful. But if we know who He is, we will be moved from fear to confidence. Not in self, not in self-confidence, but something so, so much better. I saw online this week as I was doing some research, uh, someone wrote a book and it was, um, they were saying that there are 365 instances of God in the Bible talking about getting rid of fear. One for every day of the year. And then someone else was like, actually there's 366 just in case it's a leap year. Right? So God is so faithful to us, so good to us, knowing that we are feeble and that we are weak and that we are filled with fear. And he's so good to us to continually remind us that we need not fear. But what are you fearful of? What are we fearful of? Really ask yourself this. It's so easy at times to look at someone else's situation and be like, well, of course I would trust in God. You need to trust in God. So easy maybe to look at this situation and go, of course I would trust in God, but would you? If it was you, would you really? Oftentimes it only takes losing one thing that we are in a downward spiral of fear. What would it take for you? If you lost your job, if you lost your house or your spouse, maybe a friend, a child, maybe food, for, for some of us, if we lost our hair, we would be in so much fear. There's some bald people here going like, not too late. That's okay. That's okay. It might seem silly, but it's amazing how quickly we can become so fearful of this world, even over silly things. If you want to identify the idols in your life, list the things that you fear to lose and can't get over. All of the things in your life that you are so afraid of losing, those are your idols. Every single time. Fear always comes from idolatry. When you fear the future and what it might bring, you're holding on to some kind of idol in your life. For this widow, it was the fear of starvation. It was the fear for her son. It was the fear of death itself. This is not living in the power of faith, but in the weakness of the flesh. We want to be a people who are living in the power of faith. The main point is here that we need to be empty to fear. The only way to be empty to fear is through the Word of God. We need to be reminded of the Word of God. We need to wash ourselves in the Word of God and have our minds renewed. This is what Elijah did. Did he not move from saying, fear not, and then quoting what God said he would do? And so we need the Scriptures, don't we? We need the Word of God, and so... I have five scriptures here. They're going to go on the screen. You can write them down. I'm going to read them over us. But this is what the Bible has to say about fear. In John 14, 27, it says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled, troubled neither let them be afraid famous verse, Joshua 1.9. I'm sure you've heard it before. It says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Isaiah 43.1. Love this verse. Love this verse. But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. Psalm 34, 4, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. All of them. One of my favorites as well, 2 Timothy 1, 7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. If you have fear in your life, it's not from God. 
Why? Because God has given those who believe in Jesus Christ a spirit not of fear, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. The Holy Spirit drives fear out of our lives. If we believe in God, if we trust in him, we will always be led out of fear. Fear is a sign of idolatry because we're not trusting in the Lord and what he has told us. We either have hope in something, maybe we have hope in nothing. Either way, we need to know God's word and trust in him and our fears will be cast aside. So often though, we can read these verses and we're saying, okay, that's great, that's great. But really the root of us, a root of fear is what we see about the future. It's what we see about the, f- about the future. Well, what does the Bible say? Let's go back to the Word of God. What does the Bible say about your future? I have four more verses here for us. 1 John 3, 2. Be- beloved. Beloved. I love it when, when we're called beloved. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Because we shall see him as he is. This is what we have to look forward to. 1 Peter 1, 3 and 4. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. You worried about paying the bills this month? You worried about what will come? You worried about your job? You worried about these things? Listen, you have an inheritance that is imperishable. This is what you have to look forward to. It's kept in heaven for you. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, it says, For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We have this short life of some pain, but just wait, believer in Jesus Christ, we have an eternity to live in his presence. Don't look to the things that are seen, but look to the things that are unseen. This is our future. And then Revelation 21, verse verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. You're hurting now? Just look to your future. Just look to what the Lord will do. There will be no pain. There will be no mourning, no crying, no death. These things will have passed away. If we know our future, then fear simply doesn't make sense. We can't have fear. Elijah knew this because he knew the word of God. Do you know the word of God? Because he trusted in and he had a powerful faith that was not only able to um, make him fearless in, in the opposition and in the situation that he was in, but it was it enabled him to encourage others at the same time as well. Fear is always irrational for the believer in Jesus Christ. Every single time. 1 John 4, 18 says this, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. If you've been perfected in love, if if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've been perfected in love and you have no reason to be afraid of punishment, then all fear will be cast aside. But maybe you haven't been perfected in love just yet. Maybe you haven't put your faith and love in Jesus Christ as your Savior. You see, that's why you're filled with fear. That's why you fear tomorrow. That's why you fear the situations that you're in because you haven't been perfected in love. But did you know, did you know that God became man, that Jesus Christ came to this earth humbly, humbly came as a baby. He, he, he came and he knew who we were. He lived a perfect and sinless life. He died on a cross. He rose again. Why? So that if you have faith in him, you can be perfected by love. Would you put your faith in Jesus Christ Would you put your sin aside? Would you repent of your sin and trust in Jesus Christ and in him alone for salvation and allow yourself to start living in the power of faith where there is no fear? The root of fear is always idolatry. You've believed a lie over the truth and therefore we fear. Trust in God. Oh, believer in Jesus Christ, what do we have to fear? What do we have to fear when God is on our side? There's nothing that God will not provide for you. There is nothing in your life that has not been perfected in love. 
You will be empty to fear if you are living in the power of faith. You can have a humble confidence in the one who has already made a plan for you. Just look at the text, right? Elijah moves from fear. He says, do not fear. And then he says, the jar of flour shall not be spent. And the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day of the Lord sends rain upon the earth. He trusts in the promise of God and therefore has no fear. For us, for everyone, it always looks like this. We go from fear to God's word, to obedience, to provision. You have fear, then run to God's word. Believe in God's word and obey it. Be obedient to your Savior once you're filled with faith and he will provide. He will provide. Fear, God's word, obedience, provision. The next thing we see from the life of Elijah of what it looks like to live in the power of faith is that we will be noticeably holy. Noticeably holy. Let's be careful here, though. I'm, I'm not saying that, that you will have this braggadocious faith, okay? I'm not saying that you will just put on this outward appearance of righteousness like the Pharisees and, and let everyone know how great you are. That's not what I'm talking about here. Not about, that's not what I'm talking about when I say noticeably holy. It's this inward work that the Holy Spirit is doing in your life that will be seen outwardly without really having to say a word. It is not your own righteousness, but ministers of the gospel, uh, believers in Jesus Christ, who are truly transformed by the truth of the gospel, will be different. You will be different if you are changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it will be noticeable. It will be noticeable. Do you see the light of Christ in your life? Do you see the light of Christ in your life? Is it clear that you are saved Look at the text here, verse 17, and the key really is in verse 18, but it says this, after this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house became ill, and his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. Okay, another quick science question, all right, we had one last week, one this week, see if you guys have figured this out yet. Um, What happens to humans who have no breath in them? They die, all right, we're learning, we're getting there. Verse 18, it says, And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God, that you have come to me and to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son? And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him to the upper chamber where he lodged, and he laid him on his own bed. He laid him on his own bed. Do you see in this text how uncomfortable the widow is by the very presence of Elijah? She is made very, very uncomfortable by the presence of Elijah. The woman's son was dead, and she's convicted of sin. It doesn't exactly say what the sin is, but all of a sudden she says to Elijah, you've brought the remembrance of my sin to me and caused the death of my son. We don't know exactly what this sin is she's talking about, but it's her personal sin she's talking about. And we can also see in the text that to her, whether she's right or wrong, I think she's wrong, but that there's some correlation between her sin and the death of her son. We often think this way too, right? Because of my sin, this other thing has happened. Sometimes our sin does bring consequence for sure, but our sin isn't always just related to things that happen in life. But to her, she was saying, my sin, my sin, and, and it's brought to remembrance, and this is, it's caused the death of my son. In her mind, this is going on. And so, it doesn't really say what the sin is. It's not explicit in the text, and so we've got to be careful, but I think it's helpful sometimes to sort of just kind of put ourselves there and try to figure out what might have been going on. Either way, it's sin. Sin is sin. But what was this sin? Maybe it'll help us get into the story a little more. So she's a widow, as we know. Her husband has died. And in this time period, um, we know that it was very, very difficult for widows um, at this case. And and not only a widow, but someone who also has a young son. Um, They wouldn't have been able to own land, uh, wouldn't have received an inheritance. Very difficult. And, And widows at this time were often forced to beg just for their livelihood. And you could, you could think that maybe 
This isn't in the text exactly, but just maybe, perhaps, she was, she was even forced in, because of her desperation, into prostitution. And maybe, um, in this desperate need for money, she became pregnant with this son. And now, she thinks that her sin, in, in the way that he was brought into this world, is causing his sickness and his death. It's not explicit in the text, but there is sin there, and she's correlating it to her son's death. But look at what triggers her outburst. Elijah doesn't even say a word. The presence of Elijah is convicting her of her sin. Isn't that interesting? Why is this? Why is this? Because he's noticeably holy. Because he's noticeably close to God. God's light of holiness is shining through him. When she sees Elijah, it's almost like she's seeing Christ. It kind of reminds you of the the woman at the well. All of her sin is in front of her. It says that Elijah was with them for many days. And you could just imagine that during this time period, it says he was lodging in a room. He slept there. It was, he was there for a while. But during his time here, do you think that maybe often he would sneak away and, and pray? And maybe she would see this? Um, you know, maybe uh, when they were drawing from the never-ending oil and flour in their house that he would say, hey, let's give thanks to the Lord for the food. Do you think that maybe at a time he, he played with this little boy in the yard and he would tell the little boy of the amazing stories of, of the God of Israel and how he saved them from Egypt and brought them to the promised land and, and maybe even telling him about the real cool story that ravens were bringing him bread for a while? That's a great story for children for sure. And, and just maybe she saw the holiness of God working in his life. You see, there's two responses for those who do not believe when they see someone who is living the power of faith. It's brokenness or resentment. Either someone's confronted with their sin and they're broken before God, and they change and they seek Him, or there's resentment. They curl into themselves and they resent the messenger and they resent God for calling them a sinner. This widow was made very uncomfortable because of the very presence of Elijah. Here's my question for you. Does your presence make those who do not know God uncomfortable? Does your presence make those you know who don't know God uncomfortable? Or does your presence make no difference at all? Do you have some friends, maybe some old buddies that you knew before Christ? And they still see you as the same old guy, the same old girl. They're comfortable in their sin in front of you, and you're okay with it. Do you justify it in some way, maybe saying something like this, well, if I don't act that way, they'll they'll never actually hang out with me, and if, if they don't hang out with me, how can I ever witness to them? Your witness has already been shot as if God needs you to save them. Let me submit that the reason you are not a light of Christ to them is because you either have a love for something in this world that you are unwilling to give up or you are embarrassed by your faith in Jesus Christ. Elijah's very presence was enough to lead this woman to be convicted of her sin. We need to be people who are noticeably holy because of Jesus Christ. We need to be a people that our conduct truly reflects his grace in our lives. Who are you when you're not here? The fourth thing we see in the life of Elijah, living in the power of faith, is that we will have powerful prayer. We will be powerful in prayer. The one who is living in the power of faith will have powerful prayers. It's a guarantee every single time. Let's look at the text. Verse 20. It says this, And he cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. 
And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber of the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Because of Elijah's faith, Because he had unlocked the power of faith in his life, now he was able to live in the power of faith. Part of living in the power of faith is having powerful prayers. This is how God works. We could do series and sermons and sermons just about prayer, but we just have this one point today, and I think that we can pull out some amazing truths from God's Word. You see, this is so important. We believe... That in God's sovereignty, he has ordained that our prayers would move the hand of God. I'm going to say that again, okay? We believe that in God's sovereignty, his sovereignty, that he he rules over all, he's creator of all, he is working and he is all-powerful in his sovereignty, that he has ordained, that he has decided, that he has made a way, that this is what his plan is, he has ordained that our prayers would move the hand of God. Your prayers are powerful because God has allowed them to be powerful. Many of us say, well, if God's going to do what he's going to do, if he's sovereign, why should I even pray? What's the point? What's the point in praying? Why? Because it's his will that you pray. It is God's will that you pray. Let's just bring this into a different realm, all right? Um, We would never think this way about food, okay? We know from Scripture that, and Jesus says, like, I'll feed the sparrows. Will I not feed you, right? I've clothed the lilies of the valley, right? Will I not provide for you? Don't worry about tomorrow. Worry about today, right? But none of us would be like, well, God says that I won't go hungry, so I'm not going to eat. No, what? Doesn't make any sense. No, no. God will provide you for the food, but you physically have to take the food and put it in your mouth, right? Some of us enjoy doing that more than others. That's okay. I love my food. That's okay. None of us would think that about food, but we think it about prayer. God wants to accomplish this, but he's, he's, he's saying that I want you to pray about it. That is how I'm going to accomplish my will. Our prayers need to be constant and without ceasing. Flip over to um, James chapter 5. James chapter 5, 13. And this text correlates so well to our passage today. In fact, James mentions Elijah in this text. James chapter 5, 13. It says this. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now this is so important. Like Underline this in your Bible, okay? The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And then he goes on, he says, Elijah was a man with like nature to ours. He was just like us. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. The prayers of a righteous person will be powerful. There is great power as it is working. If you are living in the power of faith, you will have powerful prayers. That's just what happens. This is what the word of the Lord says, and this is true. If you are in tune to how to pray, because you pray often, you're alone with your Savior often, and and you know what we should pray because you're in his word and you know his will, then your prayers will be in tune to the will of God, and as you pray, they will be powerful as they are at work. God will answer the prayer, and he will move the prayer in the righteous person. Three quick practical things that Elijah does that we can take notice of here. I think these are so helpful. 
The first one is that we can see that he is wrestling. He's wrestling with a specific issue. He takes the woman's son in private and, 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 he, and he prays specifically for the issue at hand. Oh Lord, would you give me grace in this moment? Oh God, would you give me special grace for this particular sin in my life to overcome? Oh God, would you help me with this specific situation? How often are our prayers just so vague and we're missing out on a specific prayer and the grace for that situation? Oh Lord, help me in this moment with this issue. Secondly, he is full of humility. He is full of humility. He's a prophet of God. He's an Israelite and he touches a dead body. This would defile him. This would make him unclean. But he stoops down and he puts himself over the boy and he prays and he prays. We need to stoop down. We need to humble ourselves before God in prayer. The prayer of a righteous person is a humble prayer. I love this picture, just a side note, I love this picture of stooping down and praying over a child. Stooping down and getting to their level and, and, and praying in a way that they can understand and, and praying that God would save these little ones. Oh Lord, would you breathe life into my children? I love that. Thirdly, he is persistent. He is persistent. Three times he stretches himself over the boy. Could have gone... Could have God done it on the first go? Yeah, of course he could. He is God. He is God. But often God waits and sees if our prayer to him is dependent to the point of repetition. Will we continue in prayer? Will we ask, seek, and knock? Do we believe that God will answer the prayer of faith? Persistent prayer really does make us know that it's all about God and not about us the things that God teaches us as we wait on him. Maybe we would take just a little bit of glory if it happened on the first go. But by waiting, by seeking, by continually praying and crying out to our God, he gets all the glory as he answers our prayers. I think that we all need to be compelled to pray with great faith and see the God at work, see God at work in our lives. You see, I can confidently stand before you today and say that if you are living in the power of faith, you will have powerful prayers. If you are seeking God truly, if you are being filled with his word, you will have powerful prayers. Why can I be so confident? Because his word says so. That's why. And we can have this confidence as well. Do you believe it? Do you really believe it? Take hold of what the Lord has promised to you. This is living the power of faith. Ask yourself, am I courageous in obedience? Am I emptied of fear? Is my life noticeably holy? Am I powerful in prayer? If so, or you say, well, I'm growing in these things, praise God for that. Praise the Lord, because he has done the work. And if not, if not, it's time maybe to head back to the brook, Hareth. It's time to go and sit and wait before your God and ask and ask and ask that he would fill you with this faith, that he would teach you so that you would not be idle, that you would not waste your life in Christ. You see, there's so much hope. There's so much hope because our God today is the same God that Elijah had. Elijah is of same nature to us. There's no difference. But Elijah had faith in God, the one true God who was working then and who is working now. Will you believe in him? Will you seek him? Will you live in the power of faith? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, oh Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you, O oh God, for the life of Elijah. Lord, not because he is great, O oh God, but because you are great. Lord, because you are working, because you are magnificent. O oh Lord, because you have a plan, and even when we don't understand that plan, O oh God, you are working. O oh God, would you allow us to be courageous in our obedience? O oh Lord, would you empty us of our fear? Would we be made noticeably holy as the Spirit fills us, O oh God? Would we bear much fruit in the Spirit? Oh Lord, and would we, oh God, could we ask that we would have powerful prayers? 
not for our glory, oh God, not for ourselves, oh God, but that you may be glorified in our lives. Oh Lord, please humble us, oh God, humble us that we would live in the power of faith unto you for your glory, oh God. Bless us in this process, oh Lord. Teach us, I pray, in Jesus' name.